talking a, a lot faster. It, there's a lot more energy here. You, you're happy to be here. Yeah, I'm happy to be here. If you ask me anything about Greenlawn Avenue, I can tell you about Montford. I can tell you about going to Montford and drinking Mad Dog 2020 or... Or if I, I got jumped by some gang guys once. I can remember almost every vivid thing that ever happened on this block, you know, Why? during the era. Because I think it was it was like a real good time in my life. Plus, you know, being around my father and everything, because I was with my father for so long, and to finally come back to him at that age, it was the right time to come back, I believe, too. How old were you? I guess I came back when I was about 15, I believe, around 15. It's, it's a real tight block over there, real tight. It was like a family, you know. I remember when it used to always, whenever it snowed, the first big storm, everybody would come out here, and it'd be a big football match. Everybody on the, on the, on this block, ages from like 14 to like 20 something, would come out here and play football. It'd be this half of the block versus this half of the block, and it would, it would be insane. Or, or like any any given su summer, the whole block would be over here playing three on three basketball, and it was like the place to be, you know, the, the thing to do. You know, back in those days, I think you know you know harmony and friendship meant everything, and you know, it was real tight. There wasn't a lot of crime and violence, you know. I mean, we always had money, but I mean, I used to go out and shovel snow to make money. I mean, people would pay you like 10 bucks to do their whole driver and your walkway. And we just made money like that every Saturday. All the guys come out there and just make about $100 just doing that all day, you know, as opposed to going out and try to gangbang or rob people. People always say that my dad plays uh, single note lines. What is single note and, and what would be the opposite of single note? Well, it was a quick silver single note type of style. I can give you an example, yeah. such as. Right. Now, Wes, Wes Montgomery played... Wes played octaves. Octaves, two notes the opposite of a single? Right. Well, yeah. they were the same note, but he played them at one, the same time. Very masterful. I got you. But Grant, coming along at that same era, it was two different sounds. Mm -hmm. And you could enjoy both just as equally. So they were going, they were going like... Two different roles. Two, then, two different thing. sounds. I mean, yeah. you, you couldn't, people say, well, try to compare them. You couldn't compare both of them with giants. Right. Uh, yeah. They both left a legacy in the music. Uh, you hear most guitar players today, uh, they're playing Grand Green or they're playing West Montgomery. Mm -hmm. You know, I think George Benson would tell you the same thing. So, uh, I mean, we were, I was hanging out near the bar somewhere, and uh, I looked over and he was, West was here. Mm -hmm. He said, hey, George. I said, hey, Wes, what you, you know, and, and, and naturally everybody loved Wes and I loved him too. Yeah. And he, and Grant was tearing it up and everybody was into the groove, you know, yeah. yeah. They were swinging. And uh, Grant said, uh, oh, and Wes told me, he said, uh, he said, he's bad, ain't he, man? I said, yeah, he sure he is, man. You know, I didn't want to rave too much to, about him, you know. And he said, yeah, man, he's my favorite guitar player. I said to myself, wow. I guess I didn't make a mistake, you know, <laughs> by choosing him as my favorite guitar player too. Man. He was very hard to hang around, though. Yeah. Because yeah. Grant always felt that everybody was trying to rip him off. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. Of all the people Grant interviewed, he seemed to have the most rapport with Rudy Van Gelder. <laughs> yeah, right. right. We're gonna end up calling you. That's right. And the recording I'm making is digital. Uh oh. Right. Uh oh. Crystal clear. Huh? Right. <laughs> it was interesting watching him almost sit at Rudy's foot like a young person, learning, except he knew why he was asking every question, and Rudy kindly obliged him. Sometimes when I, I go home and I pull out my CDs and I listen to uh, like my, my, some of my dad's albums and I, I hear him, him play a solo and it's in one speaker, and then uh, after his solo's over, Lee Morgan would, would, would come in with a, so, with a solo, it would be another speaker. Right. Why'd you do that? I mean, well, uh, that was, an, uh, th that time period is when we first started to get into stereo recording. Before that, there was only mono when everything was mixed together. I don't know, I guess that's well before your time, but there was yeah. just one track, one channel, okay. uh, uh, which uh, 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 was the finished product. And then mm -hmm. we get into w an idea of how we're going to handle this in stereo. Right. And uh, so at the time, we had to decide what to do to make it sound different from mono. Right. And as a matter of fact, the very early stereo things, we didn't even listen to it in stereo. We would record it in stereo, that is two track yeah. stereo, but we would monitor the, the, the mono speaker mm -hmm. because that was the primary release form. Right, right. So right. Uh, 
a, a, the, uh, and now, of course, they're releasing all these the so-called stereo versions, which was a result of where we had placed these people in space. Right. So usually the trumpet player would be on the right, I'm, I'm sorry, on the left, and then the guitar player. I would normally put the guitar player on the right, okay. from what I remember. I don't know if that was, yeah. but it's just what we decided to do at that yeah. time. And when I say we, it was that was a combination of the producers, uh, in, this, in this case, uh, mm -hmm. Alfred, uh, 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 Feeling, and my own. Yeah. <coughs> yeah, um, you know, back in the days, um, it seems like um, you, you, were, you were a lot busier, you know, like you, you, you do more sessions per day as opposed to now. Does that, is that, does that have anything to do with the, the fact of CDs out and it, it, it's, it's more, it takes more time to make them, more playing time, or was it less playing yes. time back in those days? You know, th this is like twice as much time now mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, that they need to, for, it's um, like an hour or more of music. Right. And even now, some of them come in and try to do that in one day. Uh, at that time, 20, 30, 35, 40 minutes of music was sufficient. Right. So the sessions naturally were shorter because they had to record less music. Right. Right. While they were, everybody was in town at that particular moment, you know, that particular Tuesday or Wednesday, whatever it was, and they mm -hmm. wanted to make the, C the, make the album. But uh, at that time, there were no CDs, and th the requirements for the huge amounts of music were, were much less. Yeah. They, I mean, they were n they were not the requir there was not the requirement for large amounts of music. Right, I got you. And it, it, it uh, brings up my, my next point, like on some albums, uh, yeah. one of my father's albums called uh, Idle Moments, they did alternate takes. Right. And I could never figure out why would they do a, a, a alternate take of a song, because apparently one of the takes was supposed to be in a reject, they weren't supposed to use it. I mean, what's, well, what's, what's the scoop in that stuff? Okay. Alternate takes really are rejected takes. Mm -hmm. Normally, a musician and a, a company, the, album, or the producer, would come in and they'd try to make the best possible product. Right. They'd play the song and, and uh, uh, they mostly try to do it better. Say, let's make another take of it. Right. So they'd make another take and then they'd pick the best one. Sometimes three takes, sometimes four. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then uh, the producer or the musician or a combination of both or whoever was responsible would make a decision. This is the best take. Everybody agreed that this was the best. And that's what would appear on the finished product. Right. So uh, the, uh, the, 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 these so-called alternate takes are reject takes. They're out takes. I got you. Uh, uh, and uh, they never were intended to be released. They never uh, were even considered to be releasable material. And some of that was because of the sound too. Occasionally, I would, you know, they would stop and say, "Listen, you, you know, it doesn't sound right. Rudy, go fix it." Yeah. So I would stop to go fix it so the sound was right. And, that would <coughs> and then that doesn't mean he wouldn't say, "Go back and erase the one that's no good." Exactly. Well, what, what do you, uh, that lives to this day. Yeah, and then really somebody goes through those vaults and is a hero and says, "Oh, I discovered some other <laughs> released music," and and and, yeah. and uh, that becomes the alternate take. It's a marketing term. I got you. You know, there's, a, there's something in your wallet I wanted to ask you about. It says, um, the greatest record ever made. And right. I, I can't see it from here. What, what is, what's that about? Uh, that's that? that's uh, John Coltrane yeah. and Johnny Hartman. Uh, that's uh, a record called The Lush Life, the Lush Life. that I made here uh, in the 60s. So apparently, then I, 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 I need to get that and add that to my collection then because oh, I would, it sounds you know, like it's oh, awesome. Oh, I really, it, it is. Yeah. I, I think it's a wonderful record. A lot of people do, too. Yeah. And it's still available. You can buy mm -hmm. it today. Jazz is more appreciated in Europe and in Japan more than in this country where it that's started. True. I think that's true today. It is. Well, I mean, why, why is that you think? Of? I have no explanation yeah. for that. I but isn't know. that crazy though? Yeah, sure is. Yeah. But I always knew everything we were doing was important in the, in the, in the older days, you know, in the 60s. Yeah. It, it really, uh, it was, uh, the music was happening at that time. Yeah. I think the record industry might have been a part of his death, just the pressure, you know, the, the money, you know, the the amount of money that they keep from the artists and certain contracts that they signed in the 60s because I, there was times when I was told that certain artists made an album, they got paid $200. Well, you gotta understand from 1960 to 1990, these albums are still selling. You know, I mean, even though they renewed the contract and, you know, and decided to give families or the, or the artists more money, but I think that the record industry is just, it's just, it's like a beast, you know, and it's just, it eats, it eats a pure art and music is an art, you know, and it shouldn't be so ugly like it is right now. You know, so I don't think, you know, saying that 10 years ago is better than now or 20 years ago is better than now. It's, it's, it's the same shit. We're all in the same shit. You know, it's just, just a different era, you know? No, your dad was a, a hardcore jazz man and he sort of modulated over the years. No, it's not that, I tell you, uh, money will make you change your mind. So uh, jazz crowd had kind of dropped off a little bit. Uh, television was competing, uh, their own recordings and video came in, right. uh, 
And so it, it was happening like that, and uh, in city after city, this is what has happened. So the, the old club experience uh, no longer exists. People have uh, videos, tapes, cassettes. Mm -hmm. So there's there's not the uh, urge and and the uh, the uh, attraction. But because I I was interested in jazz, I said that uh, while I'm in Congress, mm -hmm. I want to help these artists as much as possible. I still do. Mm -hmm. uh, it's very important that we understand that this is a, a, a vital ongoing part of our contribution to American culture. Uh, you know, everybody's playing jazz now. Right. Uh, you hear it in commercial mu music, movies. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it has taken on a life of its own on stage. Uh, but sometimes we forget where it came from. And it came out of the African-American experience. Gotcha. And it was very, very important. And, and Grant made a continuing contribution. Uh, he, he lived and worked in uh, all over the country, probably all over mm -hmm. the world. But I know he was all over the United States. And there would be great uh, periods of time when I wouldn't see him. So you know, you remind me a lot of your father. There's something about your look. Yeah. That really, I really feel that we're connected that way. You know, a lot of people told me that too. I, mean, I don't think so. Yeah. Nah, no, I, I don't know. I can tell you that it's true. Yeah. If you could do, live your life again, I know this is a stupid question I'm going to ask you. Uh, would you still want to be sitting in this control room and doing yeah. this? I can't think of a better way to make a living. <laughs> I mean, isn't it great just to come here every day and people come and play music for you? All you got to do is listen to it. And, you know, you know no, I'm here and it, it felt like I've been here before. And this is like, this is just, I wish people could really see this place. A month before he passed, he called me to let me know he was coming to St. Louis to visit his father. And he felt like he hadn't spent enough time. And he had promised his father he was going to come and stay about a week or two. And we were going to try to meet up and get together. And he wanted me to try and locate some of our old friends, classmates, so we could all kind of get, you know, meet together and mm -hmm. just chill out. I thank you for the life of my friend Grant. We went back a long way and the time I talked to him on the phone, although we weren't able to meet up as we had planned, we had such a lovely time reminiscing over our lifetime as children and the fun that we had. And, and I thank you for his life and I pray that you brought him all good. And I was really young. I didn't really know what was going on, but I think my dad kind of knew he was going to die for some reason because he's supposed to have surgery. They told him he had to have surgery. Didn't they, didn't they tell him that? Something I don't remember all of the problems that were going on. I thought it was something to do with his, uh, with aneurysm. Probably sitting over there in the corner laughing now. I just kept him, take him, pull it down, and sit here and laugh about what we're talking about him. Right. He tells Dinah, hey, baby, listen to this. Listen to this. Listen to my son and the body. <laughs> 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 they remember me, baby, you know. Hey, Sir Vaughn. Look. Hey, it wasn't that bad. 